this week in environmental science, we'll be taking a look at Chapter 7, Soil, Agriculture, and the Future of Food. Our objectives for this chapter are challenges of feeding a growing human population, different types of agriculture, the green revolution, the importance of soil, soil erosion and degradation, soil conservation, irrigation, fertilizers and pests, genetic engineering, animals raised for food, and organic agriculture. Our central case study to this chapter is entitled Farm to Table and Back Again, the Commons at Kennesaw State University. It's not surprising to see phrases like think global, eat local, or farm to table when you're dining at a trendy restaurant, but would you expect to see this when you're eating at your campus dining hall? Believe it or not, campus dining services around the country are among the industry leaders in culinary sustainability, which embraces the use of sta uh, sustainably produced local foods to provide diners delicious, nutritious meals. One leader in sustainable dining is Kennesaw State University or KSU in suburban Atlanta since 2009. They opened up their campus dining facility that serves about up to 5,000 students daily. They offer nine themed food stations and a rotating menu of 200 to 300 items, but it's the facility's commitment to sustainability that makes it noteworthy. This commitment began when the university made sustainability a prime consideration in all aspects of the facility's construction and operation. The Commons at Kennesaw even generates biodiesel from its used cooking oil for use in its university facilities. They've done other things such as eliminating use of trays because when people use just plates, they eat less and use less dishes, which helps conserve water. Their lighting uh, is helped by floor to ceiling windows so that they don't have to use as much energy for lighting. Their food waste is fed into a digester behind the facility and then broken down into a nutrient rich liquid that they use on their campus farms as a fertilizer. And the uh, commons go beyond meal time for their impacts. In 2013, they opened their own Institute for Culinary Sustainability and Hospitality, the first such degree program in the United States. They've even received uh, nationwide recognition as a notable campus dining destination. In 2013, they were awarded even beating out Walt Disney Parks and Resorts and the U.S. Air Force. Kennesaw State is not the only university integrating sustainability into their campus dining options. It's becoming a more and more common thing across the nation as we realize the importance of sustainability and preserving our earth, using less resources, and teaching our students about sustainability and really embracing this movement. While being surrounded in a campus dining hall by so much food, it's hard to think about how there are actually places in the world where not everyone has enough to eat. And remember our population of humans on Earth is 7 billion, but by 2050 we'll have 2 billion more people to feed on Earth as our population will most likely be around 9 billion. Our goal will be food security, meaning that we will try to provide enough food so there's an adequate, safe, nutritious, and reliable food supply for everyone. Providing food security to everyone will be one of our greatest challenges. The good news is that over the past half century, our ability to produce food has grown even faster than the global population. Improving people's quality of life by producing more food per person is a monumental achievement of which humanity can be proud. Despite our rising food pr 
production, roughly 870 million people worldwide suffer from undernutrition, which is receiving fewer calories than the minimum dietary energy requirement. As a result, every five seconds somewhere in the world, a child dies because he or she can't get enough to eat. Items like poverty, politics, conflict, and inefficiencies in distribution contribute to hun hunger. While there's those that don't receive enough nutrition, there are places in the world where overnutrition occurs, where people are receiving too many calories per day. Getting so much food like that leads to unhealthy weight gain and things like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. In the United States alone, 1.5 billion adults are overweight and at least 500 million of those are obese. Just as the quantity of food a person eats is important for health, so is the quality of food. Malnutrition is a shortage of nutrients that the body needs and it occurs when a person fails to obtain a complete complement of our, impro our important macromolecules that we need every day, including proteins and lipids and vitamins and minerals. Malnutrition can lead to diseases. For example, people who eat a diet that's high in starch but deficient in protein can develop a disease called kwashiorkor. This is due to a lack of protein or essential amino acids in the diet. Especially at risk are those children who've stopped breastfeeding and are not getting proteins from breast milk anymore. Symptoms include the bloated stomach, mental, and physical disabilities. Marasmus is another deficiency due to protein and in insufficient calories and includes a wasting of the body. Dietary deficiencies are also alarmingly prevalent. For example, iron deficiency leads to anemia. Iodine deficiency can cause swelling of the thyroid gland and brain damage. And vitamin A deficiency can lead to blindness. If on Earth we're going to enhance global food security, we'll need to examine ways in which we produce our food and make those methods more sustainable. This includes agriculture, which is the practice of raising crops and livestock for human use and consumption. Agriculture includes cropland, which is the land in which we raise plants for human use, such as corn and soybeans. And then there's rangeland, which is the land that we use for grazing livestock. As of about now, uh, land devoted to agriculture now covers 38% of the Earth's land. Of that, 26% is rangeland and 12% is cropland. During most of the human species' 200,000 year existence, we were hunter-gatherer, depending on wild plants and animals for our food and fiber. Then about 10,000 years ago, as the glaciers retreated and the climate swarmed, people in some cultures began to raise plants from seed and domesticate animals. For thousands of years, the work of cultivating, harvesting, storing, and distributing crops was performed by human and animal muscle power using hand towel or hand tools and simple machines and animals such as oxen and cows and horses. This is known as traditional agriculture. People who participate in traditional agriculture, including nat Native American farms, use what's called polycultures in which they plant different crops in one field. But uh, thousands of years after humans began practicing traditional agriculture, the Industrial Revolution introduced large-scale mechanization and fossil fuel combustion to agriculture just as it did to industry. Farmers replaced horses and oxen with machinery that provided faster and more powerful means of cultivating, harvesting, and transporting and processing crops. This is known as industrial agriculture. It boosts yields by using irrigation and synthetic fertilizers, and also using chemical pesticides has reduced herb herbivory by crop pests and competition from weeds. Today, industrial agriculture is practiced on 
over 25% of the world's cropland, while industrial agriculture increases yields, there are some drawbacks to it. Industrial agriculture typically uses plant monocultures in which farmers plant only one crop species in an area to increase efficiency. Planting just the one crop reduces the biodiversity of the organisms in the area and typically the organisms that they plant in the crop are all genetically the same which makes the crop more disease prone. Also, plant monocultures narrows our human diet. Globally, 90% of the food that we consume now comes from just 15 crop species and only 8 livestock species, which is a drastic reduction in the diversity of food that humans have historically eaten. For example, only 30% of the, the corn maize Varieties that grew in Mexico as recently as the 1930s still exist today. In the U.S., the varieties of some fruits and vegetables cultivated by farmers has decreased by 90% in less than half a century. Many of the crops that we plant today have been genetically engineered to be more efficient or more pest resistant or for many other reasons. Industrial agriculture's use of genetically similar crops has led scientists to be a little bit worried about the conservation of the wild relatives that today's crops came from. They fear that wild crops may be needed in the future, and so seed banks have been created in order to store those types of wild seeds. Seeds are collected and stored and periodically planted. They're also worried about wild crops genes being mixed with our genetically engineered versions. And so they, fear, they feel that wild crops must not be allowed to interbreed with genetically modified crops. The desire for a greater quantity and quality of food for our growing population led to what's called the Green Revolution. We drastically increased food production through new technologies, and crop varieties, and better farming practices. The Green Revolution began in the 1940s when American agricultural scientist Norman Borlaug introduced Mexico's farmers to a specifically bred type of wheat. That strain of wheat produced large seed heads and was resistant to to diseases, shortened stature to resist wind, and it also produced higher yields. And within two, deca two decades of planting the new crop, Mexico tripled its wheat production and was able to begin exporting it. Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work and also took his wheat to India and Pakistan and helped transform agriculture there. When Borlaug died in 2009 at age 95, he was widely celebrated as having saved more lives than anyone in history. Here's some questions to consider. I'm weighing the issues. Do you think the Green Revolution has solved problems, deferred problems, or created new ones? Which aspects of the Green Revolution do you think help in the quest for sustainability and which do not and why? Have the benefits of the Green Revolution outweighed its costs? Industrial agriculture has allowed food production to keep pace with our growing population, but there's been many, many bad environmental and social effects, such as water use and fossil fuel use, fertilizers and pesticides can worsen pollution, erosion and desertification, it requires far more energy than traditional methods, and it displaces low-income farmers who can't afford the technology, forcing them to move to the cities. Some of the benefits have been the increased in crop yields while reducing pressure to develop natural areas for new farms. We can't simply keep expanding agriculture into new areas because land suitable and available for farming is running out. Instead, we need to find ways to improve the fit efficiency of food production 
in areas that are already under cultivation. Sustainable agriculture describes agriculture that maintains the healthy soil, clean water, and genetic diversity essential to long crop and livestock production. It's agriculture that can be practiced in the same way far into the future while maintaining high yields. Treating agricultural systems as ecosystems is a key aspect of sustainable agriculture, and this general principle applies regardless of location, scale, or crop. Low input agriculture describes a approach to agriculture. In low input agriculture, there's a less use of pesticides, fertilizer, growth hormones, antibiotics, water, and fossil fuels than in industrial agriculture. The subject of agriculture in environmental science leads us to the subject of soil. Soil isn't just lifeless dirt. It's almost like its own little ecosystem. It's a complex system consisting of disintegrated rock, organic matter, water, gases, nutrients, and microorganisms. And of course, healthy soil is vital for agriculture and for forests and for the functioning of Earth's natural systems. If we abuse soil through careless or uninformed practices, we can greatly reduce its ability to sustain agriculture. By volume, soil consists roughly of about 50% mineral matter and up to 5% organic matter. The rest consists of space between the soil particles, called the pore space, taken up by air or water. The organic matter in soil includes living and dead microorganisms, as well as decaying matter derived from plants and animals. We can't also forget our very important decomposers and detritivores that live within the soil and also even burrowing animals. The composition of a region's soil can have as much influence on its ecosystems as do climate, latitude, and elevation. Soil formation begins when the lithosphere's parent material is exposed to the effects of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere. Parent material is the base geologic material in a particular location and it can be a number of things from hardened lava to volcanic ash, rocks and dunes, and bedrock, which is the solid rock comprising Earth's crust. The parent material is then broken down by weathering, which is a physical, chemical, and biological process that converts rocks into soil. Once weathering has produced fine particles, biological activity contributes to soil formation and the deposition and decomposition and accumulation of organic matter. Partial decomposition of organic matter creates something called humus, which is a dark, spongy, crumbly mass of material made up of complex organic compounds. Soils that have a lot of humus tend to hold moisture well and can be very productive for plant life. As Earth's processes occur, usually about up to six layers of soil occur, and these are called horizons. A cross-section of soil as a whole is called a soil pro profile. Most scientists definitely recognize the A, B, and C horizons, which would be the topsoil, the subsoil, and the weathered parent material, but other scientists recognize all six which may even include this O horizon on top, which is the organic litter layer. Minerals are generally transported downward as a result of leaching, which is the process in which solid particles are suspended or dissolved in liquid and then transported to another location. In some soils, leaching can happen so quickly that plants can't get the nutrients fast enough or the leached minerals could enter groundwater, which then could pose human health risks. The crucial horizon for agriculture and ecosystems is the A horizon, or the topsoil. This consists of the inorganic minerals, 
as well as the hummus, which is so important for agriculture. Also, the O and the A horizons are home to most of the countless organisms that give life to soil. In rainforests, the rain leaches minerals and nutrients, which reduces their accessibility to roots. And rapid decomposition of leaf litter results in a thin topsoil with little humus, and farming there quickly depletes the soil's fertility. Because of low nutrient content in tropical soils, people have traditionally employed what's called swidden agriculture. This is where a farmer clears a plot of forest and cultivates the land, usually for only one to a few years. And once the fertility is exhausted, they move on and clear another plot, leaving the first to grow back to forest. However, many of the abandoned sites do not regrow forest again or it's just used as pasture land for grazing livestock. As we know around here in our temperate prairies, we have lower rainfall and therefore less nutrient leaching, which results in a higher fertility for crop production. Maintaining healthy soils. Soil degradation is the loss of soil quality and productivity, and it's caused 13% loss of grain production in the last 50 years. Erosion is the removal of material from one place to another by wind or water. It's a problem when it happens faster than soil formation. Deposition is the arrival of eroded material at a new place. Erosion degrades soil ecosystems and people make land more vulnerable to erosion by over-cultivating fields, by poor planning and excessive tilling, by overgrazing rangeland with too many animals, and by clearing forests on steep slopes or with large clear cuts. And soil erosion is a global problem. Humans are the primary cause of erosion. It's occurring at unnaturally high rates. Human activities move over 10 times more soil than all other natural processes. The world's croplands have over 47 billion acres affected by erosion or soil degradation. In the United States, we lose five metric tons of soil for every ton of grain harvested. Desertification reduces productivity of arid lands. Dry lands are arid and semi-arid environments that cover about 40% of the Earth's land surface and they're definitely prone to desertification. Desertification is the loss of more than 10% productivity due to erosion, soil compaction, deforestation, overgrazing, drought, salinization, water depletion, and climate change. It endangers the food supply of 1 billion people in over 100 countries and is costing tens of billions of dollars each year. The Dust Bowl prompted the United States to fight erosion. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, farmers and ranchers grew wheat, grazed cattle, and removed native grasses, which led to the Dust Bowl. In the 1930s, drought and erosion caused black blizzards of sand. Thousands of farmers left their land and relied on governmental help to survive. Over here, we can see a map of where the Dust Bowl occurred. Up here, we can see a Kansas dust storm from the 1930s. The Dust Bowl prompted the U.S. to fight erosion, and Soil Conservation Services, or the SCS, was started in 1935 by Congress. It works with farmers to develop conservation plans for farms. It's now named the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Other countries started their own conservation agencies. Sustainable agriculture begins with soil management, such as crop rotation, which is growing different crops from one year to the next. This returns nutrients to the soil, 
and helps prevent erosion and reduces pests. We often do this with wheat and corn and soybeans. Contour farming is another method, which is plowing perpendicularly across a field, which reduces runoff. Terracing is where level platforms are cut into steep hillsides. And this staircase that's created by terracing contains rain and irrigation water. Intercropping is another method. It's the planting of different crops in alternating bands. It increases ground cover and it decreases pests and disease and replenishes soil. Shelter belts or wind breaks is another method in which rows of trees are planted along edges of fields. It slows the wind and can be combined with other methods like intercropping. Conservation tillage is another method that uh, in which residues of previous crops are left in the field to prevent erosion and the soil can soak up more water. No-till farming is an ultimate form of conservation tillage. By increasing organic matter and soil biota while reducing erosion, no-till farming and conservation tillage can improve soil quality and combat global climate change by storing carbon in soils. In the United States today, uh, nearly one quarter of farmland is under no-till cultivation and over 40% under conservation tillage. Farmers practice no-till farming with a no-till drill. First, the drill cuts a furrow through the soil surface. Number two, it drops in a seed. And three, it closes the furrow over the seed. This disturbs far less soil than does conventional tilling and reduces erosion rates on farm fields. Critics of no-till farming in the U.S. have noted that this approach often requires substantial use of chemical herbicides because weeds are not physically removed from the fields, and it also requires synthetic fertilizers because non-crop plants take up some of the soil's nutrients. And in many industrialized countries, this has indeed been the case. Proponents of no-till farming, however, point out that in developing countries like South America, farmers have departed from the industrialized model by relying more heavily on green manures, which is the dead plants as fertilizers, and by rotating fields with cover crops, including nitrogen-fixing legumes. The manure and legumes nourish the soil and the cover crops reduce weeds by taking up space that weeds would otherwise occupy. Although this approach is not often practical for large-scale intensive agriculture, farmers are educating themselves on the available approaches and choosing those that are best for their farm. Grazing practices can also contribute to soil degradation. Humans keep over 3 billion cattle, sheep, and goats. Overgrazing is when too many animals eat too much of the plant cover and impede plant regrowth. Soil is then degraded and compacted, and increased erosion makes it hard for plants to grow. Non-native plants invade, which are less palatable to livestock, and then outcompete the natural vegetation. 70% of the world's rangeland is degraded, which costs about 23 billion every year. Agricultural subsidies affect soil degradation. Many nations spend billions to subsidize agriculture. 20% of U.S. farmers' income comes from subsidies. The pros of subsidies is that it protects farmers from uncertain weather. And it might also be an initiative for farmers to keep doing what they do to help feed our growing population. The cons of subsidies is that it encourages farming of vulnerable land. It produces more food than needed, and it drives prices down. Critics propose that instead of relying on subsidies, farmers should buy insurance against losses. There's a number of U.S. and international programs that promote soil conservation. 
1985, the Conservation Reserve Program was created. Farmers are paid to put highly erodible land in conservation reserves. Trees and grass are planted instead of crops. Each dollar spent saves one ton of topsoil and it generates income for farmers. It improves water quality and provides habitat for wildlife. 1.8 billion per year protects 27 million acres. The 2014 Farm Bill limits protection to 24 million acres. Irrigation boosts productivity but can damage soil. Irrigation is artificially providing water to support agriculture. It's needed in unproductive regions that have become productive farmland. Water logging is when water suffoca suffocates roots in over irrigated soils. Salinization is the buildup of salts in surface soil layers, and it's worse in dry land areas. Salinization inhibits production of 20% of irrigated cropland, costing over 11 billion per year. Sustainable approaches to irrigation maximize efficiency. One of the most effective ways to reduce water use in agriculture is to better match crops to climate. For instance, if you have a dry region, planting rice and cotton would not be a good choice because it uses too much water. Choosing other crops that would require less water, like beans and wheat, would enable those areas to remain agriculturally productive and yet greatly reduce the use of water. Another approach is to embrace new technologies that improve water use efficiency in irrigation. Currently, irrigation efficiency worldwide is actually pretty low. Plants end up using only about 40% of the water that we apply by irrigation and the rest evaporates or soaks into the soil away from the plant root. New drip irrigation systems that deliver water directly to the plant roots can increase efficiency to over 90%. Fertilizers boost yields but can be over applied. Fertilizers are substances that contain essential nutrients to enhance crop production. Nitrogen and phosphorus are two big components of fertilizers. Inorganic fertilizers are mined or synthetically manufactured mineral supplements. Organic fertilizers are the remains or wastes of organisms like manure and crop residues and fresh vegetation also called green manure and compost. It's produced when decomposers break down organic matter. Inorganic fertilizers boosted global production in the late 1900s, but severely pollute. Leaching and runoff of inorganic fertilizers causes groundwater contamination, dead zones in water systems, and air pollution from evaporated nitrates. Sustainable approaches to fertilizing delivers nutrients directly to plant roots and avoids over application. Such as in drip irrigation, you can add the fertilizer directly to the water and drip it in to where it's actually needed near the plant. No-till or low-till systems may inject fertilizers with seeds. Or farmers can monitor soil nutrients and add only when they're low. This can help reduce over-application. Strips of vegetation along field edges and streams can be used to capture nutrient runoff. Organic fertilizers can also be embraced. It improves not only the nutrients in the soil, but it adds organic matter, which then improves the water retention and the overall productivity of the soil. The preferred approach is to integrate or inorganic and organic fertilizer systems. Because we cluster food plants together in agriculture, especially in monocultures, pests have been able to take advantage 
of this and move from plant to plant and specialize. A pest is any organism that damages crops that are valuable to us. A weed is any plant that competes with our crops. There's nothing inherently malevolent in the behavior of a, of a pest or a weed. Those organisms are simply trying to live like every other organism to survive and reproduce. But they affect our, fi our farm productivity when doing so. Pesticides are poisons that target pest organisms. For example, insecticides kill insects, herbicides kill plants, and fungicides kill fungi. Exposure to synthetic pesticides can cause health problems for humans and other organisms. Unfortunately, pests can evolve resistance to pesticides. Individuals that can metabolize and detoxify a pesticide survive and pass those genes on to their offspring. As the population increases, pesticides then lose their effectiveness. Recall that from our previous discussions of natural selection, individuals within populations already vary in their genetic makeup. Because most insects, weeds, and microbes can exist in huge numbers, it's likely that Within that variation, there's a small fraction of individuals that by chance already have genes that enable them to metabolize and detoxify a pesticide. Those individuals then can survive the exposure to the pesticide, whereas individuals without the genes will not. If an insect that is genetically resistant to an insecticide survives and then mates with another resistant individual, the genes for pesticide resistance can be passed on to their offspring. As resistant individuals become more prevalent in the pest population, insecticide applications will cease to be effective and the population will increase in size. In many cases, industrial chemists are caught up in what's called an evolutionary arms race with the pests that they battle. Because we seem to be stuck in this cyclical process, it's been nicknamed a pesticide treadmill. There's over 586 species that are resistant to 330 insecticides. Hundreds of weeds and plant diseases have evolved resistance to herbicides and pesticides. Many species have evolved resistance to multiple chemicals, such as the green peach aphid and the Colorado potato beetle and the diamondback moth. Biological control pits one organism against the next and can be used to control pests in a more natural way instead of a synthetic way. Biological control or biocontrol uses a pest predators or diseases to control the pests. Examples are parasitoid wasps and the introduction of the cactus moth from Argentina to Australia. There's risks of biocontrol because the organisms that we release can't easily be controlled or they could begin to harm non-targets. For example, cactus moths introduced to Caribbean islands spread to Florida and are now eating native cacti in southeastern U.S. So biocontrol must be carefully planned and regulated. An integrated pest management combines varied approaches to pest control. Integrated pest management, or IPM, incorporates numerous techniques to suppress pests, including close monitoring of pest populations, biocontrol, synthetic chemical use when needed, habitat alteration, crop rotation, transgenic crops, alternative tillage methods, and mechanical pest removal. IPM in Indonesia increased rice yield 13% and eliminated subsidy payments. Pollinators are beneficial bugs worth preserving. Not all insects are pests. Some are absolutely vital. Over 800 cultivated plants rely on pollinators, like bees, for example. Pollination is when a male plant sex cell fertilizes a female sex cell. 
flowers are evolutionary adaptations to attract pollinators to them. They attract pollinators by using nectar and pollen, sweet smells, and bright coloration. While an insect or a pollinator is picking up these little rewards such as nectar and these sweet smells, they're also picking up the, the male sex cells and then transporting it to other flowers, which helps increase the diversity within plant populations. The U.S. bees provide 15 billion per year in pollination services, but parasitic mites have decimated populations and beekeepers were driven to financial ruin. Colony collapse disorder is when entire beehives have died one third of all U.S. honeybees have died and causes are unknown but most likely involve insecticides and new parasites and a combination of stresses that weaken the bees immune systems and, enjoy, and destroy social communication. Raising animals for food as wealth and commerce increase, so does consumption of milk, m meat, and eggs. Since 1950, global meat production has increased fivefold and per capita meat consumption has doubled. Eating meat is far less energy efficient than eating crops. 90% of energy is lost from one trophic level to the next. We've discussed this in previous chapters. Some animals convert grain into meat more efficiently than others. Land and water are needed to raise food for livestock, and eggs and chicken meat require the least. Producing beef requires the most. When we choose what we eat, we choose how we use resources. Feedlots or factory farms are also called Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, or CAFOs. Huge warehouses or pens deliver food to animals living at extremely high densities. They produce over half of the world's pork and most of its poultry. The benefits are that it allows a greater production of affordable meat and reduces grazing impacts on land. But there's costs. 45% of the world's grain is fed to livestock, which endangers food security for the world's poor. Feedlots produce huge amounts of manure and urine and can co pollute surface water and groundwater. Crowded housing causes outbreaks in disease and the heavy use of antibiotics is also another downfall in order to prevent these diseases. It produces more greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxides, than automobile emissions. Another way to produce food is raising seafood with aquaculture. Worldwide, fish populations are plummeting, and there's an increased demand in technology. So, aquaculture is the raising of aquatic organisms in a controlled environment. We see a pie chart over here of how much of each are raised, with fish being at 49.6%, aquatic plants at 24.1%, mollusks, crustaceans, and other aquatic animals following behind. It's the fastest growing type of food production and is most widespread in Asia. The benefits are a reduced pressure on over-harvested wild fish and uses fewer fossil fuels and it's safer and produces more fish than commercial fishing. The drawbacks are that there's a lot of waste produced. It uses grain which affects food supplies for people and fish meal is made from wild ocean fish. Escaped fish introduce disease or outcompete wild fish. Genetically modified foods. 
The Green Revolution enabled us to feed a greater number of, and proportion of the world's people, but relentless population growth is demanding still more innovation. A new set of potential solutions began to arise in the 1980s and 1990s as advances in genetics enabled scientists to directly alter the genes of organisms, including crop, plants, and livestock. The genetic modification of organisms that provide us food holds promise to enhance nutrition and the efficiency of agriculture while lessening impacts on the planet's environmental systems. However, genetic modification may also pose risks that are not yet well understood. This possibility has given rise to anxiety and protest by consumer advocates, small farmers, environmental activists and critics of big business. The genetic modification of crops and livestock is one type of genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is any process whereby scientists directly manipulate an organism's genetic material in the laboratory by adding, deleting, or changing segments of its DNA. Genetically modified organisms are organisms that have been genetically engineered using what's called recombinant DNA, which is DNA that's been patched together from the DNA of multiple organisms. The goal is to place genes that code for certain desirable traits, such as rapid growth, disease resistance, or high nutritional content into organisms lacking those traits. An organism that contains DNA from another species is called a transgenic organism, and the genes that have moved between them are called transgenes. The creation of transgenic organisms is one type of what's called biotechnology, the application of biological science to create products derived from organisms. It's helped to develop medicines, clean up pollution, aid cancer research, dissolve blood clots, and make better food. Here's a chart of several genetic or genetically modified foods, such as golden rice, virus-resistant papaya, GM salmon or genetically modified salmon, biotech potatoes, and BT corn. You can read the same chart from your textbook. Biotechnology is transforming the products around us. GM foods have gone from science fiction to mainstream agriculture in the last three decades. GM crops today are engineered to resist herbicides and insect attack. In the U.S. today, 90% of corn, soybeans, cotton, and canola consist of genetically modified strains. Worldwide, four out of five soybean and cotton plants are now transgenic, and one out of three corn and canola plants. Seventy percent of processed foods in the United States stores contain GM ingredients. Soybeans are the most common type of GM crop. The United States leads the world in GM crops, with Brazil following right behind us. What are the impacts of, of GM foods? There's mixed results on pesticide use. Insecticide use has declined, but herbicide use has increased. GM foods can advance sustainable agriculture when grown with no-till farming and drought resistance and high yielding. Problems with GM foods include the fact that they're expensive with little incentive to develop crops for small-scale farmers. Resistance to the weed killer glyphosate is being documented more widely than in the past. Ecological impacts of GM foods pose the greatest threat. GM oilseed rape was found hybridizing with wild mustard. Creeping bent grass engineered for golf courses has pollinated wild grass up to 21 kilometers away. 
Many experts think we should follow the precautionary principle and proceed with caution on GM foods. There's public debate over GM foods that continues. Many people think that tinkering with food supply is dangerous or morally wrong. Others fear that global food supply is dominated by large corporations that develop GM technologies. Agrobiotech corporations have taken out patents on transgenes. Although Americans have accepted GM foods, consumers in Europe, Japan, and other nations are still une uneasy about GM foods. 60 plus nations require labeling of GM foods. A frequently asked question is, is it safe to eat genetically modified foods? In principle, there's nothing about the process of genetic engineering that should make genetically modified food any less safe to eat than food produced by conventional methods. The fact that technology is used to move a gene does not make the gene unsafe. Thus, to determine whether GM foods pose any health risks, studies must be done comparing those foods with conventional versions, one by one, just as researchers would study any other substance for health risks. Thus far, no study has shown undeniable evidence of human health impacts on humans from any GM food, but this lack of evidence does not guarantee that such foods pose no risk. A great deal of research is controlled by the companies that develop GM foods, and we will never be able to test all GM foods. Hence, the effects on humans of consuming GM foods will largely be examined with correlative studies over long periods in coming decades. The growth of sustainable agriculture. Sustainable agriculture keeps high crop yields and minimizes resource use and decreases environmental impacts. Organic agriculture uses no synthetic fertilizers, insecticides, fungicides, or herbicides. The Organic Food Production Act in 1990 established national standards that all organic products must follow. The USDA issued criteria in 2000 by which food could be labeled organic. California, Washington, and Texas have passed stricter guidelines for labeling. There's benefits and risks of organic farming. The benefits are lower input costs, enhanced income, and reduced chemical pollution and soil degradation. Farmer risks include organic approaches must be used for three years before products can become certified and sold at higher prices. And obstacles for consumers are the higher price for organic foods, but many, many are willing to actually pay that price. Worldwide sales surpass $63 billion. Three out of four Americans buy organic food, at least occasionally. The production of organic food is increasing with demand as people question things such as GM foods and the use of antibiotics in food and fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. The U.S. 2014 Farm Bill has provisions to directly aid organic agriculture. It helps defray certification costs. The European Union supports farmers financially during conservation to organic farming. Reduced inputs and higher market prices can make it as profitable, pro profitable as conventional methods. In the science behind the story, in this chapter, they ask how productive is organic farming? The world's longest running field experiments on organic farming are in Switzerland and Pennsylvania. After more than 21 years of study, Dr. Paul Motter's team concluded that organic plots were highly efficient and represent a realistic alternative to conventional farming. Modder's team found that soil and organic plots had better structure, better supply of some nutrients, much more microbial activity, and much more invertebrate biodiversity.
organic crops equaled conventional crops in yield. They produced more profit, they required less energy input, and released fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Locally supported agriculture is growing. Sustainable agriculture reduces fossil fuel use from long distance transports of products. The U average U.S. food product travels a thousand miles. Farmers markets provide fresh locally grown food and are increasing in popularity. They provide organic items and unique local varieties. CSA is community supported agriculture in which consumers pay farmers in advance for their produce. Consumers get fresh food while farmers get a guaranteed income. In weighing the issues, here's some items to consider for you. Do you want food labeled? The USDA issues labels to certify that products claiming to be organic have met government organic standards. Critics of genetically modified food want GM products to be labeled as well. Do you want your food labeled to indicate whether it's organic or genetically modified? Would you choose among foods based on such labeling? How might your food choices and purchasing decisions have envir environmental impacts, good or bad? Sustainable agriculture provides a roadmap for the future. It mimics natural ecosystems. They operate in cycles and are internally stabilized by negative feedback loops. Agricultural systems can be integrated with the surrounding ecosystems, reducing environmental impacts from food production. Making agriculture sustainable is crucial for all of us. In conclusion, industrialized agriculture has had substantial negative environmental consequences. To support 9 billion humans, we must shift to sustainable agriculture to prevent further land degradation. Biological pest control, organic agriculture, pollinator protection, preservation of native crops, sustainable aquaculture, and careful, responsible genetic modification of food are all issues we must consider.